I want to start off this morning by saying a happy new year to every single one of you on behalf of Marla and I. And just know this, our prayer is that you get to know God greater and deeper and in in a more real way in the coming year. Now, it's a new year and there's been a lot of talk about it also being a new decade. Uh, That's kind of cool, being at the brink of a new decade. It makes me reflect a little bit on what this past decade brought us. And I just want to throw out a few things here. And maybe you remember some of these things from this past decade. There's the fidget spinners. Remember those things, right? Every kid needed to have one of those. There was the Harlem Shake. There was Pokemon Go where they were coming on our property. And, you know, I I, I didn't didn't know what it was about, but I knew they were coming here. There was the rise of social media media and specifically Instagram, there was the rise of the smartphone. It gained momentum across the world. I mean, Netflix really grew in this past decade. It's hard to believe that it was only in 2010 that the first iPad came out, right? We also had the fake missile warning in Hawaii. How many people remember seeing that and hearing about that? We had the Gangnam style, remember that thing, right? And who can forget the ice bucket challenge, right? And uh, just some really great things and some things that maybe we want to forget as well. But we're on the brink of another year. A decade is in front of us. And what it means for a lot of us, it just means new. New things to go after, new attributes to strive for. You know, I I did some reading and the top New Year's resolutions for 2020 are as follows. Lose weight, save more money, get healthier or exercise more, quit smoking, drink less, spend more time with family and travel more. And I don't know about you guys, but I read those and I'm like, don't we have the same goals like every year? Like, come on, humanity. You know what I'm saying? Like each January, I feel like the list is exactly the same. And in my head, I'm kind of like, okay, come on, people. If we know eating junk food's bad, let's move on from it. If we know we need to exercise, let's start. If we know that drinking too much isn't that good, let's shift that pattern. But we tend to be creatures of habit and We actually, it's true, we find security and safety in old rhythms. In fact, the old patterns guarantee outcomes that each of us can manage and each of us know then what to expect. But when it comes to shifting, let's say, old into new, every single one of us, we need to deal with something called loss aversion. And loss aversion says that we value what we have and who we are more than what we don't have and who we aren't. See, new invents different. New produces change, and that becomes difficult for some people to embrace. American Giant, they're a clothing manufacturer, and they say they make the greatest sweatshirt ever made. Uh, That's their tagline. I'm not doing a promo here, just saying that. And, And in one of their ads, they say this, and I love the wording here. They said, comfortable isn't comfortable. Comfortable never gets up before dawn. Comfortable won't get its hands dirty. Comfortable has nothing to prove. Comfortable can't get the job done. Comfortable doesn't have new ideas. Comfortable won't dive in head first. Comfortable isn't the American dream. Comfortable has no guts. Comfortable never dares to be great. Comfortable falls apart at the seams. Don't get comfortable. And so at the beginning of this year, how do you necessarily say, okay, I want to do this, I don't want to be comfortable, or how do you shift from wanting to work on the same thing all the time to actually doing it? How do we move from desire to action, from comfortable to uncomfortable? I've heard it said this way, if you want something different, you need to do something different. Makes sense, right? So for example, if you want to grow in Uh, influence, or if you want to grow in effectiveness, really in any area of your life, you target one area and only one. You pick one discipline to go after. So your list of resolutions isn't 10, it's actually one, because each of us is better at changing one thing in our life at a time than a whole bunch of things at once. 
John Maxwell, he's an author and a leadership coach. He says it, uh, uh, that you can't rush growth. And he actually writes this. Plants need to grow, and though they may grow every day, it takes a lot of growing to do a lot of showing. In other words, small improvements over time make a big difference. And so let me ask you here this morning, what is one area you want to target for growth this year? One area you want new in your life. This past week, we asked that question on our church Instagram account, and here are some of the answers that individuals from our church community shared. Someone said, I want to read a chapter of my Bible every day. I'm like, that's awesome. That's actually what I do. That's my devotional pattern. Great. Someone else said, I want to read through the Bible in a year. I want to get into a healthy morning routine. I want to finish my degree strong. I don't want to let fear drive my actions. I want to step out in obedience. Someone said, I don't want shame to control me. I'm actually going to be talking about that next week. I want to join a small group for the first time. Someone wrote this, and parents, hear me out. I want to embrace the everyday moments with my kids. It's big, right? Especially when your kids are little. Someone said, I want to do freedom session for the first time. I want to work on my marriage. And someone said, I want to get off Instagram for a month. And we do this because we want to improve. We want new patterns in our lives. We want to take a new step. Well, did you know that the word new is used around 280 times in the Bible? New is actually an inherent trait of God and how God works. Like the fact that even the second part of the Bible is called the New Testament indicates how essential this reality, this idea, really is. A lot of theology, which just means the study of God, lands here as well. So take, for instance, if you were to read through the Bible, you would come across themes like this. New creation, new birth, new man, New woman, new commandment, new covenant, new life. I could go on here, but those are a few things that we read in the Bible. And those terms refer to the ultimate new available to all people, which is this. Jesus came to earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross to save us from our sins. He rose again, or he rose from the dead to conquer death. And because of his love, grace, and mercy, and the sacrifice he made, he brings life for every single one of us now and for eternity if we believe on who he was. That's the new covenant. That's new life in Christ. You see, there's this expectation of new all throughout God's story. In the Old Testament, we had prophets, which, by the way, were just spokespersons for God, and they talked about God's new purpose for this nation called Israel. In the New Testament, when Jesus was on the earth, he talked about a new way of following God, which changed the old. And what we see, what we understand is that new isn't something to be feared, shied away from, shunned, or seen as negative in the biblical context. New is something that becomes an inherent trait of God. And I think our desire every year at the beginning of a new year to contextualize new in some way in our life actually be, becomes the reflection of God in our life. Scripture calls it the amajo Dei, the image of God on our lives. And this series, New, is going to focus on some of God's promises of new that I feel are worth hearing at the start of a new year. Promises that you can internalize and hold on to. Promises that will bring perspective and clarity to your life. Promises that will encourage and sustain. Promises that will direct and help you in the decisions you make. Promises that you can take in helping you embrace new. And so this morning, I want to focus on one of those promises. It's found in the Old Testament, and it's written by a prophet by the name of Isaiah. He was writing these words to the nation of Israel during a time in the life of Israel when they were kind of stuck. Things were not going anywhere. Things were not moving. And remember, a, a prophet was a spokesperson for God, right? And so this is what he wrote on behalf of God. So this is God's word. I'm the Lord, your Holy One. Israel's creator, your king. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. This is what the Lord says. Forget the former things. 
Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I make it a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And so what I want to do for us this morning is kind of walk through those verses and show us how they apply to our lives, show us what they mean, and how we can practically depend upon them, understand them, and live them out. The first thing we have to understand with new is that new entails three things according to this passage. Number one, new recognizes who God is. Number two, new remembers what God did. And number three, new realizes what God is doing. Now, verse 15, okay, it starts by declaring who God is. It starts with this, I am the Lord. Now, the Hebrew word for Lord, and I say Hebrew because that's what the Old Testament was originally written in, that word for Lord there is Adonai. And that means one who possesses and exercises power and authority. So in other words, God is reminding the people, I've got control of everything. What a great reminder, eh? The beginning of this new year where the, 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 the political system, there's a little bit of tension going on in our world right now. God's saying, I've got control of everything. I'm the Lord of your life. Don't worry. I'm orchestrating things. I'm here. I'm working even when you feel like I'm not working. And then he goes on. He says this, I'm the Lord, your holy one, Israel's creator, your king. And I love what God does here because you know what he's doing? He's going personal. Twice he underscores this. He says, your holy one, your king. God is making himself known to the people as a personal God. Not someone who is far off or unengaged, but someone who is there, someone they can trust, someone they can look to, someone who's got their back. And so friends, at the start of 2020, let me remind you of who God is. He is your God. He is your Holy One. He is your King. He is the one who will never leave you nor forsake you. He is the one who will always provide, always sustain, always protect. He's the one who walks with you through the valleys. He's the one that you can trust. He's the one you can look to, the one that does life with you, the one who wants to have this deeper relationship with you. It's kind of like God was saying here in this passage. Okay, before I tell you anything about the future, before I tell you anything about new, I just want to remind you of who I am. Maybe you need to be reminded of who God is today. Reminded that you are not alone in this journey of loss. Reminded that you are not abandoned in your situation. Reminded that he is there. He's not far off. And friends, I can't stress this enough. Own this. Walk in this. Be confident in this. And what God is doing here is he's laying a little bit of a foundation for new. He's saying, remember who I am because when you go into the new, it can be a little scary. Because new means leaving your comfort zone. It means getting uncomfortable. New means something different in your life. So before you head into new, just remember this. I've got your back. Friends, God has your back. And so first off, he reminds the people who he is. And then he reminds them of what he's done for them. It says this. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. And what God is referencing here is the miraculous escape Israel had experienced under the oppression of the nation of Egypt. So what happened was they were leaving Egypt. Um, Pharaoh and his guys decided they didn't want to let them leave, so they started chasing them. They get to this sea called the Red Sea. Israel thinks they're hooped. They're going to be captured again. God parts the sea. Israel crosses through on dry ground without getting captured. And what God is saying here is, I've done some massive, incredible things. I've done some amazing things. I've carried you through one of the toughest, most difficult scenarios, and I provided a way for you. That's who I am. That's what I did. It kind of reminds me of the song that we've been singing around here that that says, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
See, new always remembers what God has done. And for Israel, he was reminding them, I took care of your hardest moments. I helped you through your most difficult time. And and, and notice this, okay? God never promised them they wouldn't experience difficult times. He, however, lays the foundation that he will carry them through those times. It's not the avoidance of trials. It's accommodation within the trials that he promises. And so I want to take you back to Isaiah here. And I just want you to notice an interesting line that we have here. The line says this, and they lay there never to rise again. This was God referencing the Egyptians who were chasing the Israelites and how he took care of them. In other words, he's saying in your most difficult moment, I took care of your enemy, not just for a little bit, but for good. You see, those things in our life, those difficulties, those trials, that stuff that feels like it's your enemy and you can never get over it, when you surrender it to God, when you give it up to him, when God takes control of it, friend, hear me out, it's done for good. Never again to be part of your life. Another Old Testament writer, he put it this way. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours, but God's. God fights our battles. God fights for you. We have a God who contends for us. We have a God who makes a way when we don't see one. And that is why we don't have to fear the new. We don't have to be discouraged because our God is for us. He's always been that way. He always will be, and that will never change. God is for you. See, when God takes care of something, it's taken care of for good, but, but maybe you're a little bit like me. Because sometimes, sometimes I like to bring things up that have been laid to rest, if you know what I'm talking about. It's that family member who did that thing and you're still annoyed by it even though it was just years ago. It's your spouse who did something you can't get over and you can't forgive them. It's the friend you haven't talked to in months and God may have buried it, but we sure love to rehash it. Or it exists on a personal level as well. Like scripture tells us that he separates our sins as far as the east is from the west and we just tend to keep bringing them up and we can't move on. Or we have this promise that he doesn't hold our past against us, but we keep rehashing those circumstances in our mind. You know, human nature, in fact, is to stay stuck, to keep replaying and repeating, to play the victim, to stay hurt. And God's saying, if you've surrendered it to me, if you've brought it to me, I've buried that, I took care of it, let's move forward, let's get unstuck, let's move into the new. Friends, understand this. You will never move on to something new with God if you're holding on to something from the past that God has already buried. Is there something you need to let go of for good? Is there something you just need to get rid of for good? Is there something you just need to throw into the sea of forgetfulness and move on? New recognizes who God is. New remembers what God did and new realizes what God is doing. Listen to what Isaiah writes next. He says this, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. And at first that almost seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Because first he says, okay, remember what I've done. And then he's kind of like, eh, forget about it, right? You know what I'm saying? He reminds them, God does, of what he's done. And then he says, but don't dwell there. Don't camp there. Don't live there. Don't set up tents there. Basically, what God is saying is we can't stay here. And if you've been in our orbit for any amount of time, we say that here all the time. We can't stay here. So where do you set up camp and tend to live? What part of your past has become your constant present? What event defines your today more than today defines today? 
Are you dwelling on a hurt that you can't let go of? Are you dwelling on a tragedy that has made you bitter? Are you dwelling on the time when God was good, when he moved into your life? Like, do you say things like, remember when God used to move? Remember when God did things? Remember when we used to do it this way and God was so rich? Have you set up camp somewhere and you just find it hard to move on? God says this, remember the past, sure, but don't dwell on the past. Remember what I've done, but don't set up camp there because I want you to move forward. I want you to move into the future. And then he goes on. He says this, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? New here means something fresh, something remarkable. In fact, it means something that didn't exist before. And so God's saying, With new, things are going to look a little different today than they did yesterday. Things are going to change. That's all part of new. And I know for some of you, when you reflect on your life, that's just a welcomed interruption. You want things to change. You want things to look different. You want something fresh. And I love the fact that God asked the question here, um, do you perceive it? That implies that we can actually miss out on what God is doing. We can actually stay married to the past that we miss the present and what God is orchestrating. It's a little bit like the guy who um, was living in a town and he received the warning one day that there was a huge storm coming and a flood was imminent. And officials told all the people of this town, okay, everyone, we need to evacuate. And the guy was like, you know what? I'm going to stay. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to pray that God will save me. So his neighbor swung by and said, hey man, we're leaving and there's room for our car. You should really join us. He's like, no, no, I'm going to believe God's going to save me here. And so as the water started to rise, a guy in the canoe kind of went by his house and said, hop in, I got room for you. And the guy's like, no, I'm all good. Um, I'm okay. God's going to save me. And the waters kept rising, kept rising. And and, and suddenly a police motorboat came by and they're like, you should really get in, man. We can take you to safety. He's like, guys, I'm good. I believe God's going to save me. So the waters kept rising and finally this guy was standing on the roof of his house and there came a police helicopter and they dropped down a ladder and they said, jump on the ladder, we'll take you to safety. And the guy said, I'm good, God will save me. Well, shortly after that, the waters rose and the man drowned. And so in heaven, the man met with God and said, God, what gives? Like I put all my faith in you, why didn't you come and save me? To which God said, I sent you a warning, a car, a canoe, a motorboat, and a helicopter. You missed all five of my provisions, and at this point, I had no choice but to bring you home, man. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) New realizes what God is doing. So relish past moments, those, those times where you sensed him the most, if you have those in your life, but don't dwell there, because then you have a high chance of missing what he's doing today. Friends, listen to me, and I mean this. God has something new for you. God has something next for you. And what kind of next, what kind of new is it? What is he orchestrating? What is he making? I want to take you back to Isaiah here. This is what he writes. He says, I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So remember, God said I made a way when it didn't seem possible, right? I got you out of Egypt. But that was then, and this is now. And I'm going to make a way today when it doesn't seem possible. Why? Because I'm the God of the impossible. I did it for them, and friends, God's saying, I can do it for you. And God nails two areas where we face the impossible in our lives. He says the wilderness and the wasteland. He can make a way in the wilderness. And you know what the wilderness is? It's kind of like the desert. So think about this. God's saying, when you feel burnt, when you feel lost, when you feel tired, when you feel thirsty for something more in life, that's when he comes and specializes and he walks alongside of you and he does something. That's when he says, I can make a way when you think you're you're done. When you think there isn't a way out of this. When you're burnt down, let down, exhausted. That's when I come and do what only I can do because I am the God of the impossible. I can make a way in the wilderness. And I can make streams in the wasteland. And and what happens in the wasteland? There's wild animals there. And in the wasteland of life, you know what happens to us? We get scared. 
we feel ill-equipped. We feel defeated. God's saying, it's in those moments, you know what I can do? I can guide you. I can do something new. I can make streams in the wasteland. And here's the cool thing about streams. I think most of you know this already. Streams kind of flow. They're small and then they connect with other streams and they get a little bit bigger and then those streams eventually flow into a larger body of water like an ocean or a big lake. And so what God is saying is when you think you're in over your head, when you find yourself in the wasteland, when you're scared, confused, not knowing which way to go, I can make a stream right there for you and know this, that stream is just the beginning of what I'm going to do. It's just the beginning of what I want to do and it's going to lead to something richer and better in your life. God can make a way and God can make streams. You know what those represent? A way is all about direction and a stream is all about refreshment. And at the beginning of this year, maybe you're just saying, God, I need some direction. I don't know what's up. I don't know what to do. I don't know what path I should take here. Ask him. He is your God, your Holy One. He will provide that. Or maybe you're saying, I just need some refreshment, man. My soul is tired. I, I, I'm kind of, you know, getting comfortable in my Christian walk. And I, I just need that refreshment of God in my life. Ask him, he will do that. Maybe you're in the wilderness. Maybe you're in the wasteland. And you need this. So starting this year, God's saying the new thing I want to do in your life is I want to bring you direction. And I want to bring you refreshment. Don't Dwell on the past because, you know what? Today is a new day. Don't dwell on those good things. Don't dwell on those bad things. Today, God is doing something new. And I love the words here. He says, see, I am doing a new thing. Notice it doesn't say, see, I'm going to be doing a new thing or I'm about to do something. It says, I am doing. Meaning, it's happening right now. All we have to do is see it perceive it, be aware of it, and not miss it. So friends, as you face 2020, may you realize that new recognizes who God is, new remembers what God did, and new realizes what God is doing. And I believe this. He can give you the direction that you've been asking and seeking for. He can refresh your soul when you feel that you've been knocked down. He's moving and working and orchestrating things right now in your life. And listen to me. Your best days aren't behind you. The fabulous times aren't all finished. He is your Holy One, your God. He's the one who's saying, don't dwell on the past. I'm going to do something new. You know, remember I said, um, If you want something different, you need to do something different. What's the one thing in your life that you're going to go after this year? That one new thing in your life. As you do this, will you remember the words of Isaiah? The the process that Isaiah gives us here, I think, is very practical. First off, if God isn't your God, make that decision to follow him. Secondly, Remembers, remember what he's done in your life, but please don't dwell there. And thirdly, recognize that God is moving and working in your life and in your circumstances right now. He's the God of the impossible and he wants to bring direction and refreshment to you. And my prayer is that that encourages you today, that strengthens you today, that it helps you get up and go, yes, I'm going after this new that God wants for me. I'm gonna ask you to stand, please. I want to close in prayer in a moment. But before I do, this is what I want to do. I I really just unpack those verses for us here today. And I'm going to ask you to do this. You don't have to do this, but I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I want to read that passage to you one more time. And I want you to listen intently as if God is speaking these words to you. and, And what is he saying through this to you now? I'm the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a a wick. Forget the former things. 
Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these words that are so vivid at the beginning of a year. And I pray for all of us that we understand, Lord, that you are for us. And as we start going into this year, we walk with our head held high and in confidence, knowing that the living God walks with us. You can make ways where ways seem impossible and you can do what only you can do because you are that God. And so just make that, that, that fact, that reality so potent in every single one of our lives. I pray for those men and women here who are searching for direction. May you speak that clearly into their hearts and minds as they're looking, uh, you know, this way or that way or this door or that door. Speak clearly because you bring that. I pray for those who just need refreshment in their soul. Holy Spirit, come and refresh them. Make them in love with you passionately again, God. And may we just follow you and know you. God, I pray for that person here who might be saying, yeah, actually my first, my new this year is to make you my God to make you my Lord. And if that's you, why don't you just pray with me right now? God, as I see myself here, I say, I wanna start this new year with a different pattern in my life, and that is making you Lord and leader of my life. So Jesus, I thank you that you came, that you died, that you rose again, that you offer me life and life to the full, and I surrender all that I am to you completely, and I wanna make you Lord and leader of my life. And God, I pray for every individual, for every couple, and for every family represented in this place today. At the beginning of this year, may Jesus reign in their life. May Jesus reign in their hearts. May Jesus reign in their relationships. May Jesus reign in their homes. And I pray that they go forward knowing that you are doing a new thing. Things can change. Things can look different because they have the all-powerful, mighty God who's making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And I pray this in your powerful and awesome name, Christ. Amen. You know, if you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer of surrendering your life to Christ, I would love for you to do one more thing. And that is just text the word life to 555-888. We'd give you a digital booklet by doing that and also give you an opportunity just to connect with one of our pastors. And in this booklet, it just helps you understand what it means to follow Jesus and know Jesus and take this next journey, this new journey in your life. If you want prayer about anything in your life, um, know that we're gonna have our prayer team available down at the front right here after the service. They would love to pray with you and for you. Friends, thanks for being here this morning. Know that you are loved and prayed for. And at the beginning of this year, hold your head up because know this, God is for you. Have an incredible Sunday. Thanks for being here.